To mark the 200th anniversary of the founding of the town of Greece, the Greece Historical Society presents a bicentennial snapshot. Each week, we take a look at a particular aspect of Greece history. Today, we are talking about the wild and lawless days of Prohibition. In 1909, a vote to make Greece a dry town was narrowly defeated. The agricultural interests of the town clashed with the beach resorts and tourist attractions that catered to a clientele which drank. One newspaper account said, quote, The grudge of the farmers was that their hired help deserted as soon as they got a month's pay and bathed in the alcoholic delights of Charlotte and Ontario Beach. End quote. On the other side of the debate were the many town residents of Irish, German, and Italian descent for whom wine and spirits were an everyday part of their culture. By the time Congress took up the question of national prohibition, 33 of the 48 states were already dry. When Congress sent the 18th Amendment to the states for ratification, where it needed three-fourths approval, they allowed a generous seven years for its passage. But in just 13 months, enough states said yes to the amendment to pass it. Drinking liquor was never illegal. People were allowed to drink intoxicating liquor in their own homes or in the home of a friend when they were a bona fide guest. And it was legal to make or consume wine or cider in the home. Buying and selling it was illegal. People were not allowed to carry a hip flask or give or receive a bottle of liquor as a gift. Exempted from the law was the use of alcohol in lawful industries for religious practices such as communion wine and for scientific and medicinal purposes. Intoxicating liquor could be obtained by a doctor's prescription. The rate of sales for medicinal alcohol went up 400%. Mothers in the kitchen washing out the jugs, sisters in the pantry bottling the suds, fathers in the cellar mixing up the hops, Johnny's on the front porch watching for the cops. This says it all. Ordinary people, probably law-abiding citizens before 1920, were defying the law, and many were living in the town of Greece. Rum runners were smuggling liquor from Canada by sea, and bootleggers carried it over the roads. With eight miles of shoreline and roads leading to downtown Rochester and points west and east, Greece was a hotbed of prohibition defiance. Canadian Ben Kerr, the self-styled king of the rum runners, was one of the most successful of the rum smugglers. He made regular trips to the beaches from Greece east to Putneyville. He refused to land on American shores. Customers had to row out to his boat. He frequently changed his drop days, and he wouldn't travel under a full moon, preferring dark, foggy, or hazy nights. Joan Winghart Sullivan wrote about her father, Bernie Winghart, her paternal uncle, Ernie, and her aunt, Mamie, who was a shaler. They were known as the bootlegging trio. Andrew J. Weideman was collector of the Port of Rochester for much of Prohibition, and as such, he supervised many of the sorties against rum runners on both lake and land throughout his district, an area which covered 178 miles from the western end of Orleans County east to Oswego County. He was diligent, aggressive, and resourceful in his quest for Prohibition scofflaws. Once, he walked the beach from Charlotte to Manitou, investigating rumors of liquor shipments being offloaded in obscure spots. On the walk, he came across a group of people hiding under a tarp with contraband alcohol. Wiedemann often accompanied the Coast Guard in the pursuit of rum runners in the darkest hours of the night. He would shout, We are the United States Customs Officers. I order you to halt. On July 12, 1924, he and his agents chased a truck laden with 1,200 bottles of ale 18 miles along Ridge Road. Bullets flew as gunfire was exchanged. Andrew Wiedemann caught both Ben Kerr and the bootlegging trio. But his biggest challenge was the notorious Stoud Brothers from the town of Greece. By the way, all three of the books mentioned here today are in the museum's reference library. The Stoud Brothers. On July 8, 1930, the Democrat and Chronicle wrote this about them. They are, quote, the most dangerous and intrepid gang of rum runners in western New York, end quote. Local newspapers also characterized the brothers as the most daring, most powerful, and notorious of smugglers. 
The gang operated out of a home on Grandview Heights Road, today South Drive. They look pretty innocent, don't they? But they were ruthless thugs when they grew up. From right to left, oldest to youngest, Carl, George, Edward, and Milton called Midge. They were the sons of George C. and Ida Stoud. The couple also had three daughters. Their father was the postmaster of Rochester from 1917 to 1921. He had plenty of trouble with them as teenagers, but he did not live to see their prohibition notoriety. Their mother had also died, but their stepmother was still living. Carl was the eldest, born about 1895. His nickname was Kay the Bishop. He had a muscle infirmity and walked with a limp. He acted as the gang's accountant, keeping the books for shipments and payments, and also for Midge's speakeasies. He also frequently provided bail for George and Eddie. George was born in early 1900. He was described as a scrapper, tall and lean. Eddie, born also in 1900, did most of the dirty work. Midge was born in 1901. He was broad-shouldered and tall at six foot three inches. Although the youngest, he was the boss and brains of the gang. The newspaper called him the Little Caesar of Rochester's rum-running hierarchy. The reference, of course, being to the Edward G. Robinson movie. The brothers quickly established the lakefront from Sodas Point to Oak Orchard as their domain and were ruthless in enforcing the boundaries. Mid Stout had a fleet of large cars, Pierce Arrows and Studebakers, which he altered so they could stash up to 500 quart bottles of whiskey, quote, in the seats, in backs of seats, false floors, and even false side panels in the doors, end quote. The Stout's uncle Fred owned a shoe store, and they would hide whiskey bottles and shoe boxes at the rear of the store until they could sell or transport them. The Stouds altered this car so that poison mustard gas was emitted from the exhaust pipe. It was registered under a false name, but was owned by Midge. George was arrested wearing only his underwear, trying to escape capture after the car was stopped by agents. This same car was involved in a Christmas Eve raid led by Andrew Weideman. The Stouds would find a cooperative farmer who would let them hide the liquor in a barn. Some had underground tunnels linking the shore to barn basements. Late at night, the beer, whiskey, ale, and wine would be transported in modified cars to speakeasies all around the area, including the many that populated Greece. This photo shows 200 cases of assorted liquor, which was seized by border patrolmen Monday, December 24, 1928. Midge and George Stout, along with four other men in their gang, were arrested in connection with the raid. The liquor, which was composed of whiskey and champagne, was intended for the Rochester holiday trade. Tire tracks in the snow alerted agents to this cash in a farming farm. George served some jail time on a few occasions, but nothing major. Authorities could never get a conviction against Midge. Later in life, Midge ran the town tavern on Gibbs Street in Rochester, and for many years, he, George, and Eddie had an interest in the Grove House in Greece. Their career as rum runners and bootleggers was mostly forgotten. So where was all that booze going? Quite a bit of it was staying right here in Greece. And that's the subject of our next snapshot. joining us this week. Next week, we take a look at Greece speakeasies. This is Maureen Whalen inviting you to join us next Tuesday for another Bicentennial Snapshot presented by the Greece Historical Society. Want to learn more from the Greece Historical Society and Museum? Then click that subscribe button for more content and hit that bell icon to get notified when there's more Bicentennial Snapshots. You can visit us on the web at greasehistoricalsociety.org. You can find us on Facebook at Greece Historical Society. And you can stop in at the Greece Historical Society at 595 Long Pound Road. 